We thank God for our heart that heals and for his word that declares he is near to the broken in heart. Hallelujah. The nearness of God is very important to our lives. Today I want to talk to you about thankfulness. As we enter, Brother JJ, thank you this morning for making us realize that we are 41 days before the end of this year. 41 days before 2016 is over and 2017 has begun. Some of you haven't even started on some of your 2016 resolutions. You got, look at your neighbor and say, you got 41 days to get it accomplished. And if you haven't accomplished, God is gracious enough to let you roll it over to the next year. Isn't that a good thing? Amen. Amen. We thank God for the word today. It comes from the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And I'll be reading the King James Version of the word of God today. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. It says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. In everything, in everything, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Amen. You may be seated. As you go to your seat, just tap your neighbor and ask him the question, what are you thankful for? I think proper English would have us not end it with four, and we would say, for what are you thankful? But either way it goes, look at somebody and ask them, what are you thankful for? Ushers, you may seat those that are waiting. Amen. American gospel music singer and songwriter and recording artist whose career has spanned over six decades, Pastor Shirley Caesar is a multi-award winning artist with 11 Grammy Awards, seven Dove Awards to her credit, and she is known as the First Lady of Gospel Music. She began recording at the age of 12. Shirley Caesar has released over 40 albums. She sang with Albertina Walker, Cassietta George, Dorothy Norwood, Inez Andrews, Dolores Washington and James Cleveland as a part of the Caravans, one of gospel music's first recording girl groups, and it made her a household name in the gospel uh, community in the 1960s, but then she branched into her own solo career. She has recorded over 40 albums. She's won or received about 11 Grammy Awards, 14 Stellar, 18 Dove Awards, an Essence Award, the McDonald's Golden Circle Lifetime Achievement Award, the NAACP Lifetime Achievement Award, Rhapsody and Rhythm Award for the National Museum of African American Music, as well as she's been inducted in the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. Not many of you have lived long in the Christian circle without knowing the name Shirley Caesar. According to SoundScan, she has sold 2.2 million albums since 1991. And as of last week, Shirley Caesar became the number one rapper on black Twitter. She broke the internet, as they say. She broke the internet because of her Thanksgiving-inspired meme from a snippet from her legendary gospel song, Hold My Mule. Some of you are tuned into the internet, and some of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. This is the 8 a.m. service. Some of y'all don't look at Facebook. But it's branded as the You Name It Challenge, and it builds off of Shirley Caesar's chant in response to the question, Grandma, what are you cooking for Thanksgiving? And Shirley responds, beans, greens, potatoes, tomatoes, chicken, hams, turkey, dogs. She goes down a list of things, and needless to say that the memes have brought us such joy this past week in a time when we needed a break, in a time when we needed to laugh, in a time when we needed to see something other than the news, which has been divisive, which has been hurtful, 
which has been full of disappointments and pain, we needed to see something different. God sent us a laugh, but behind every laugh was a very serious message, and it was a message of thanks. In our text for today, we read what Paul is saying to the church at Thessalonica, Thessalonica, goodness gracious, with the church in Thessalonia, he speaks to this church and he says to them some practical advice for their Christian living. He gives them some help and some hope for the time in which they lived. And that message is relevant for each one of us today. As I was preparing for this message, I began to think about what their lives were like in the time of the first century church. And it's very different from us in 21st century. In that time, they didn't think about Sunday morning being a time of getting up and getting dressed to impress, to come and be entertained. Hello, somebody. They, they didn't think about church in that manner, but they came together so that they could encourage one another. They came together with the true understanding that I need you and you need me. Because the truth was in the first century church, it meant believing in a resurrected Savior, but it also meant that there was a possibility of causing angry uh, Romans to be angry with you or to cause the Greeks to be upset with you or the, uh, the zealous Jews to come after you. So it meant persecution for their faith, for their beliefs. They could be persecuted. They could be ostracized. They could be put aside. They could be put on the outside. It meant being beaten or crucifixed, or they could be tortured or even stoned to death for their faith in Christ. Now, I don't know that many of us 21st century believers would make our way to church if we knew that it came at such a cost. But there are people all around the world who are still dealing with the persecution of their faith because to be a follower for Christ meant that they had to give up everything. They had to give up everything. Some of us can't come to church if our toe hurt. Some of us can't come to church if our hair is not right. If we don't have the right thing to wear, some of us allow an attitude to keep us from coming to church. Somebody looked at me crazy in the pew last week, and I don't, I don't feel like going to that place anymore. Somebody boo walked out on them, and I can't get myself together to go to church. But all my brothers and sisters, let me tell you today that the church is the place that you come to get your help. The church is the place to help you refocus and think all the good things that God has done for you. Oh, some of you hadn't thought to give God thanks until today when they started singing. It could have been you. Some of you hadn't thought to give God thanks until today when they started talking about how good God is. What a marvelous, miraculous gift that God has given unto us, that it is by the power in the name of Jesus that we have hope and we have help and we have life. Some of us hadn't even thought to give God thanks. Look at your neighbor's side eye and say, is this for you today? Yeah. See, Paul's letter to this young church, it was to encourage them. It was to help them understand the second coming of Christ, that they were seeing their friends and their loved ones die, and they were expecting Christ to come right away, but they had to wait until God's timing was going to be right. It was to give them some hope while they were being persecuted, while they were going through the hard times, while they were facing their own trials. Paul gave them this message so that they would be encouraged in their faith. He wanted to prepare them for the work that they had ahead of them. He didn't want them to quit or to give up because things got hard. Some of us are quitting too easy on God. God wants you to keep pressing your way, keep pushing and letting your faith grow. God wants you to stay focused and stay on task because he has some things intended for you. The fifth chapter of the text today is especially blessed because Paul gives the believers some final instructions. He tells them these things. He says, build each other up. He says, respect leaders. He says, hold leaders with the highest regards. He says, live in peace, my God. He says, warn the idle, the people that are being lazy. Give them a warning. Encourage the timid if they're being weak and being too, too shallow. Encourage them in their faith. He said, to help the people that are weak, if they can't do it on their own, help them out. He says, be patient. Some of you don't have any patience at all, and God wants you to be patient. He says, resist revenge. Don't always 
try to get even with somebody. He says, be joyful. My God, some of you don't know what it's like to have joy anymore because you've let the world steal it from you. He says, pray continually. And some of us have a hard time praying just once a day, but he says, pray continually. He says, give thanks. He wants you to not put out the Holy Spirit's fire. He said, let the Holy Spirit burn. He says, don't treat the prophecies with contempt and avoid every kind of evil. But he's giving them uh, the instruction to know that they can count on God's help. And it's a constant help for them. The fifth chapter of Thessalonians, I encourage you to read that full chapter as you go about your week this week. And let it be an encouragement to you to help you reconnect to what God wants you to do, especially when you're going through your trials. Paul gives this church what they needed in that moment. But it also is a reminder for each one of us that every day we need to be thankful. Every day we need to be encouraged. Every day we need to help somebody else. Every day we need to revere others. Every day we need to bless somebody. Every day we need to stay connected to God. It gives us an encouragement each day. And I ask you this week as you go through the week of Thanksgiving to ask yourself this question, for what am I thankful for? For what can can I give God some thanks for? What has God done these other days of the year? I have 41 days left in 2016. So what can I say? Thank you, God, for that he has brought me the rest of this time throughout this year. What is it that you can give God thanks for? The first point I want you to see that the Bible says here is to be joyful. Paul wants you to know that you need to be joyful. How is it that you can be joyful in the midst of your sorrows? We've had a, a tremendous year in this, in this country this past year. And for many of us, we've been so connected and so bought in and so committed into it. And when things don't turn out the way that we anticipate or we expect it to turn out, how can we be joyful? God, you got me in this situation. God, did you let this happen? God, why did you allow this to happen? Be joyful. Uh, the Bible says in Nehemiah 8 and 10 that the joy of the Lord is your strength. If you feel weak and you feel worn out, if you feel disappointed and you feel tired, then you just need to go back and turn back to the Lord because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Our prayerfulness and thankfulness, it should not fluctuate with the world's circumstances or how we feel about things. Those things are things that are committed. But in our humanity, we allow our feelings to rule. I promise you, if you walked around today looking like how you really felt, people will be feeling really sorry for you. But most of us already know that we don't let the devil see us sweat. Most of us already know that God has already proclaimed victory for our lives. Most of us already know that the Word of God gives us the victory and says we are winners. Relinda, we can't let the enemy triumph over us. And so we're able to walk faithfully with God, with our joy, because we know that the joy that we have, the world did not give it and guess what he cannot take it away give your neighbor a side eye and ask him say are you being joyful are you allowing come on you're allowing God to pour into you the spirit of God which is your joy and your strength are you allowing the spirit of God to rule in your life or are you allowing the world's circumstance to overtake you guess what I tell you this one thing Donald Trump will not be sitting in my house on every Sunday but I tell you who is in my house who ruler over my house, who is Lord of my house. That's Jesus Christ, my Savior and my King. Now, I didn't vote for Donald Trump, but I'll respect his position as President of the United States of America because my word teaches me that the heart of the King is in his hand. And I know that my God can co control every heart. My God can do what he wants to do. He can lift up high and he can bring down low. Hallelujah. And so I don't put my faith in the White House, but I put my faith in his house. Somebody needs to get a clue about this thing. It's not the man who wins. It's God who triumphs.
realms. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says that many are of our plans of a man, but it's the Lord's plan that prevails. And so God has a big and perfect plan. We cannot understand the plans of God. We cannot understand the mind of God. But he promised us in Jeremiah 29 and 11 that he has plans for us that are good to give us a future and a hope. So I don't walk around hopeless like I don't have anything to deal with. I trust and believe that my God will still be God. Hallelujah. I just had to get that one out. Some of us still walking around and I'm still posting a few things in my feelings about this election. But the truth is, is that my God reigns. My God rules. No matter how I feel about it, I got to trust my God for the faith that he has our future in his hands. James 1, 2, and 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. God wants you to know that when you're facing those trials, that you can still maintain your joy because there is something going to be working on the inside to clean up what's happening on the outside. Hallelujah. God wants you to know it's not all over. Some of us looking at it like this the end. This ain't the end. This is not the end. There's a benefit we receive from our trials, and we call it joy. Hallelujah. We call it joy. Joy that God gives. Not joy what the world gives, but joy. The Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. It says the joy of the Lord is your strength. It says weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. God wants you to know he hasn't forgotten you. He sees just where you are and he knows where your feelings are. The Bible says that we have not a high priest who is not touched by our infirmities. In other words, God wants you to know that he is our high priest. He's touched by the feelings of our infirmities. He's touched by the way that we feel. But he has not walked away or turned his back towards us. He is our strength and our joy. Today I choose joy. I choose to be joyful. I choose to not let the world's situation affect me in the way that I cannot handle it. I choose to let it drive me to prayer. I choose to let it drive me closer to God, but I choose joy. Let me, let me pause for a minute because some of you missing that. It's, it's a choice. I can choose to be sorrowful or I can choose to be joyful. That means the thing that I'm going to feed is going to feed in my joy. See, some of you are feeding yourself with such negativity and you're feeding yourself with such fear that you don't allow the joy to feed your spirit. And so you have to intentionally choose to be joyful. Same thing you do for, to be happy, to be loved, all of those things that are positive things in life. In order to get to that point, you've got to choose to be in that place. You can't just allow whatever happens to you to affect your whole outcome. Yeah, you might lose a job, but guess what? God's got a new opportunity for you. Hallelujah. You might lose a relationship, but sometimes to lose is to gain. You've got to choose joy. Look at somebody and grab them by the hand today and tell them, choose joy. Come on, I choose to be happy in the midst of my sorrow. I choose my joy. I choose to hold my peace when all hell is breaking out about me. I choose my joy. I choose to be joyful when my circumstance say something totally different. I choose joy. I don't hear nobody proclaiming joy over their life. Joy. Joy. Tell three people, I choose joy. Come on, it's a choice. I choose joy. I choose joy. You never know what somebody is facing today. Somebody may have come in here on their last leg today. It may be their last little bit, their last bit of strength, their last ounce of getting it together today. But today, choose joy, my sister. Choose joy, my brother, because God wants you to know you might be at the end of your rope, but his rope is just beginning. Hallelujah. 
Listen, when Paul told the people at Thessalonia to, to choose joy, he was just opening a door for them. It was just starting in that manner. He had told them all these other things, encourage and help one another, but he said, choose joy. But the next thing he says is to help them with their attitude is to get their prayer life together. He says, pray always, be prayerful, pray continually. Now, most of you are thinking, wait a minute, I can't be on my knees all day long. Who said be on your knees all day long? The Bible doesn't say be on your knees all day long, but it says be prayerful. And the thing about being prayerful is that you have now shifted to get an attitude of prayer. You've shifted to have a spirit of prayer. That means before you make a decision, I'm going to pray on that. That means when somebody comes at you with the wrong, wrong words or the wrong attitude, I'm going to pray on that. Before you even get up out of the bed and say, let me get on with my day, I'm going to pray about that. Before you open up your phone and look at your agenda, you said, I'm going to pray on this. Before you make a business decision, before you start a business meeting, before you begin something brand new, you say, I'm going to pray on this. Before you eat your first meal of the day, knowing that there are people hungry all over the world, you say, I'm going to bless this food and pray on this food because there are people who are hungry who don't have and there are people who have worked to make this this meal come to my table people who have picked this food people who have planted this food people who have picked it people who have brought it to market people who have washed it people who have sold it and I'm just gonna thank God for everything that I have be prayerful you don't have to be on your knees all day but you when you get an attitude of prayer then you can really start to see and thank God for everything that he has given us to you. Philippians 4 and 6 says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, by prayer and petition. That means praying and asking, prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, make your request be made known unto God. The Lord's not looking for complainers. He's not looking for people who got everything to say, but I don't have God, but only if you would give me God. The Lord is looking for people who will bless his name, even when you don't have, but he wants prayer warriors who are able to give him prayers and petitions, who are able to say, God, it's by your word that you said the silver and the gold are yours. God, you know I'm lacking in financial resources right now, but everything belongs to you, God. You know where it is, God. You can release resources into my life. God is looking for people who will trust him in the midst of, so that when you pray, you pray God's word. Listen, God wants to hear your request. Reverend White and he wants to hear what you have to say. He said, call unto me and I will be found of you. God wants to hear what you got to say to him. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to have a relationship with him. He wants you to be able to, to bless his name and to go to him for your needs. Why? Because he is the one that supplies all your needs. He doesn't want you to run to this person and run to that person asking, can you meet my need? Can you give me this? Can you bless me with that. God wants you to know, do you know he's God? Is he, is he your God? Is he positioned in the right place in your life? And your prayers are going to let God know what you think about him, my God. God wants to know where do you position him in your life? Do you see him as your Lord and Savior? Do you see him as the one that meets every need in your life? Do you see and believe that he can make the end from the beginning and that he can meet everything in between? Do do you know that he is the one that can ease your mind, that can calm your spirit, that can watch out over your babies, that can bring your loved one back? Oh, do you know who he is? Do you know that he is God? Somebody needs to give God some thanks in here because he is our God. Do you believe him? Do you delight yourself in him? He says in his word, delight thyself in the Lord also, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. When you pray to God, how do you come before him? Boldly, the word of God says. Before the throne of grace, we can come boldly. We can come and ask God. We can ask God for what our needs are, and he is able to meet our needs. We can talk to God because we have relationship with him. He's not just some judge in the sky. He's our Father, Jesus. He's our daddy. He's our Abba 
the Father. He is the one that loves us. And he knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. Hallelujah. The Bible said he called you by name. He knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly what you're struggling with. He knows exactly what your mindset has been. The stuff you don't articulate to anybody else, God already knows. Hallelujah. He knows what your weaknesses are. He knows what your faults are. He knows what your failures and shortcomings are. And guess what? He still loves you. Hallelujah. He's our God. So Paul tells the believers, be joyful. He tells them, be prayerful. And he tells them, be thankful. Be thankful. But some of us are saying, but God, I got so many needs. But God said, thank me for what you got. Woo! Be thankful. Thank me for what you already have. The problem with having so many needs is every now and then we forget what we got. We, we look at what we don't have. We see a half empty glass instead of a half full glass. We miss the blessings of God that has made us rich and fat. We 40, 50, 60 years old. We can't even think to look back and see how God has brought us through. That's why I love testimony service because somebody always has an opportunity to say how good God has been. And they make you think for a minute that it could have been you, that you could have been the one living outdoors with no shoes, no clothes, and all that. Yeah, that's what testimony does. It reminds you that if it had not been for the grace and mercy of God, then there go I. It reminds you that if it had not been for God's hand on your life, directing you, keeping your mind, Jesus, keeping your mind when everything else was going crazy and other people you know been through the same stuff you going through, lost their mind. Oh, God. God, when keeping your body, healing your body, when you've been through sickness and people have died from the sicknesses you've been through, but you came out alive on the other side, still shouting, still dressing yourself, still getting yourself together, driving yourself to work in your good fancy car. Come on, I know when God has been good. The Word of God says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good and His mercy endured forever. And so we are reminded that we are to continually thank God. God for his mercy. We're continually supposed to give God praise for how good he is. How long does his mercy last? It lasts forever. Tell somebody it lasts forever. We don't, we don't get weary in our well-doing, Melanie, because the Bible says we'll reap a harvest if we faint not. If God's mercy is enduring forever, then that means at some point in time, you're going to see the benefit of the reward of what you've been sowing into. Some of you have been sowing for a long time. Oh, Oh God, when is my change going to come? Oh God, when is my blessing going to come? Oh, but stay thankful in this moment, God. I thank you that my change is coming. I thank you that my blessing is coming. I thank you that I'm going to reap a harvest for the seeds I've been sowing. I thank you, God, already for everything you've already done for me. Let me show you how magnificent our God is. Shirley Caesar has been singing Hold My Mule for a long time. Some of y'all know the song about shouting John. See, this is how the church, we focus on one thing, right? We've been focusing on shouting John for a long time. Look at the burn. We've been saying, hold my mule so I can shout. We want to get, hold my mule. I need somebody to get my things here that are burdening me down, things that are slowing me down, things that are keeping me from getting my praise on. So that's what the church is. We focus on all this. But guess what? The world hears this song, and they catch something that I never even heard in the song. I've been listening to it forever. And they catch this part. I never heard her say, I got beans greens, potatoes, tomatoes. I never heard Shirley say that part, but somebody's looking at the internet one day and they decide, huh, this is a nice little remix. And so they take a little clip out of what Shirley said some years ago, and then they begin to replay it. They remix it, as you know it is in the, in the technology term. They remix it. And then it's, they put a nice little underbeat with it. And so now everybody in the world starts hearing this beat with beans, greens, potatoes, tomatoes, and they're like, ah. Oh. And so people, some people twerk into it, oh Lord. And some people dance into it, help them, Jesus. And some people rap into it. People adding their own flavor to it. They're doing their own thing. But I thought about it the 
this morning and I said, God, is this just materialism? Are they taking what is, is yours and, and making it vile? What are they doing? The Lord said, look, there was one day I went out to preach and there were a whole bunch of people who showed up and I couldn't feed them all at that moment. I told the disciples, I said, why don't y'all go out and get bread? And the disciples looked and they said, but Lord, where are we going to get bread from at this time? And there's not enough bread in the whole town to feed these people. And the Lord said, wait a minute. But he called forth the little boy. And the little boy had two little lo uh, fish and five loaves of bread. And the Lord said, I'm going to take this. And he blessed it and he broke it and he gave that bread. And he sent it out and he fed 5,000 people, men. And then there were more women and children. And the Bible says that there was a miracle of the fish and the bread. That's what we know it as. And then the Lord preached to the people. And the people received from God. What am I saying to you? I'm saying that the world could take a little bitty clip out of a song. And what are they talking about? Thanksgiving dinner. They're talking about beans, greens, potatoes, tomatoes. But all these people are now looking at the internet and they're looking to see where can I find this song? So they start pulling up Shirley Caesar's testimony of old shouting John. You know, we know it in the church because we've been shouting to it for a long time. But the world is now receiving because God said the physical needs will be met for them. So now their spiritual needs can be met. Oh, so we get caught up in what's happening in the physical world. I mean, we stuck in the church, stuck in the spiritual world, but the world itself is stuck now in the physical world because they want satisfaction from things. They want satisfaction from food and God wants to satisfy their spirits. Hallelujah. And so now we ought to be praying for the people who are doing the you name it challenge because they thinking about the food they're going to eat for Thanksgiving. And we need to begin as a church praying for them, for the spiritual things that the word can give them, that they can be uplifted and enlightened. So when we start praying for them, we pray that they will begin to think, what are they thankful for? Not what they cooking and eating, but what are they thankful for? And some of us are thankful to God because God has been blessing us. And we've got more than beans, greens, potatoes, tomatoes, and dogs, and rams and hams and all that. We've got love, joy, peace, and kindness. It's known as the fruit of the Spirit. We've got open arms and a testimony to draw others to Christ because the Word declares that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the Word of our testimony. We've got blessings and favor and prosperity and health and happiness. We've got humanity, humility. We've got family. We've got friends. We've got prospects and associates. We've got blessings on the left and blessings on the right. We've got money in Wells Fargo, Chase, Bank of America, and BBVA Compass. We've got a job, a position, a career, a 401k, and some insurance. We've got a wife, a husband. We've got kids and a house and a car and a yard. We've got blessings from God. We've got a refrigerator full of food, a closet full of clothes, and drawers that we cannot close. Oh, we've got the blessings of God. We've got many things we can be thankful for. I challenge you today to ask yourself, what am I thankful for? And tell somebody, you name it. You name it, I've got blessings on the left and blessings on the right. Tell somebody, you name it. I can thank God for the challenge that he gives me today. Hallelujah, his challenges. Hallelujah helps me think back about the things that God has done in my life. And I can say thank you, Jesus, for every blessing that has made me rich. Hallelujah. And I'm not talking about monetary rich. I'm talking about the richness that comes on the inside. Somebody needs to thank God today. Hallelujah. And name your challenge. Name your thankfulness. Name your blessing that God has given you. What are you thankful for today? Tell two people, you name it. I'm thankful for it. You name it. I'm grateful for it. You name it. I thank God that he kept me. I thank God that he lifted me. I thank God that he turned me around. I thank God that he stopped me in my own pathway and put me on his street and let me walk freely with power and boldness. What do you thank God for? You need to think about it today. And this Thanksgiving, begin to give God thanks as you 
Jesus. Hallelujah. I thank God for the one brother who put the under track with Shirley Caesar and made this thing go viral so people can now hear the message of God and be thankful. Hallelujah. Tell somebody, you name it. You name it. In the midst of every sorrow and pain, God gives us a reason to say thank you. Come on, deacons, minister. 